tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about possessive pain and ravenous relationships. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, filling in for my good friend Steve Taylor. And tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Dan A. Cardoza and Mark Toes are voice talents Nick Goroff and Olivia Steele. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights. Turn on the dark. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Blender's Eyewear. While the snow is slowly melting, calling for clearer, brighter skies. That's right, folks. The seasons of the sun are upon us, not to mention spring break, meaning it's time to start thinking about protecting one of the greatest gifts that we have as human beings, our eyes. That's where Blender's Eyewear comes in. Fresh from San Diego, California, comes the only sunglasses brand I'm ever going to wear again. I'm talking about Blender's eyewear, and you're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I got the Jaded Tiger shades, and I've honestly never seen anything like them. Their sleek design with bright blue coloring makes me feel cool as ice. Even in the warmer weather, they're perfect to wear when I'm at the beach, going fishing, or on long walks when the sun is setting. Blender's team of in-house designers are constantly coming up with new styles, from orange polarized wraparounds, tortoise shell frames with purple lenses, to classic gold arms on black lens. Check it out for yourself. Score 15% off your Blender's purchase by visiting blenderseyewear.com and entering promo code CHILLINGVIP. That's blenderseyewear.com Code Chilling VIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. Our first story tonight is written by Dan A. Cardoza and is performed by Melissa Medina, Lucas Webley, and Eric Peabody. In it, we'll meet Kevin, a man suffering from freakish headaches. As the cause of his headaches screams to be revealed, the effects cry even louder. Without further ado, I present to you, Migraine. There are a thousand ways a house can invite you in, but first you have to knock, and after, after, 
You have to answer the door, silly. And that's only if you want to invite the worst kind of darkness in. The pressure behind my eyes. The headaches have returned. They're back. First, the auras. This bleached out whiteness I, I can't help but see. And these feelings of alien detachment. Damn it. Last night and this afternoon, my migraines felt deadly. My migraines are called hypnics. In terms of migraines, they are hypersonic and explosive. Today, they've returned with a cluster bag of vengeance. My new prescription, Maxalts. It's the only thing they can kick their ass. I just doubled up on my daily dose. So what's with a sudden uptick in symptoms? They are rare, these headaches. They've gotten so bad. They've been waking me up from a restless sleep. That's their trademark, their M.O. They tend to cluster bomb my parietal lobe, especially since I've been under more stress at home. I can sense when they are coming. First, I experience an aura, as I said. I consider the aura the knock on my door. Not long after, these bright flashes stumble across the threshold of my mind. That's when I know the explosive migraines will follow. Jeff, my Kaiser doctor, described them as... This kind of headache comes across as a pulsating, fiery blast, and these quick bursts light up your occipital lobe. Think of the occipital lobe as the motherboard of your vision. It's not good, Kevin. Let's see. How can I explain what I see in more detail? It's like in the 20th century when photographers had to double as chemists to take photographs. First, they'd ignite magnesium filaments in pure oxygen. Not unlike me, the flash occurred after a switch was tripped. The flash was a controlled lightning bolt in a tiny glass bottle, or the brain in my case. The flashes allow the darkest of subjects to be washed in light. After I experienced the aura, I get this rusty taste in my mouth. It's followed by this whirr and whining sound. The scary noise reminds me what it sounds like when a spark of fire or light unwinds. Just like in one of those vintage 50s flashbulbs. The headaches have been fewer, granted, but they've gotten worse. They're more intense when I feel vulnerable, angry, and out of control. Gotta tell you, that's how I spend a lot of my time lately. Dude, out of control and angry. It was MD Jeff Wade that Kaiser diagnosed the exotic migraines almost five years ago. Not long after, I got married for a third time. The joke is I married three monsters. One Medusa and her two deformed teenage pit bulls. GP Wade caused my headaches, migraines on crack. They've been associated with extreme violence. I told my doctor that my headaches aren't very helpful with everything at home. I explained that I wasn't sure I could cope with everything going down in my life. But he said because I was a teddy bear, he was sure I wouldn't act on any of my feelings of aggression. MD Jeff was nice, though. He said he was aware of how they can make me feel out of control at times. But he was optimistic that I would be able to adjust to them without the medication and all. Oh, okay. That makes me feel better. Not... I joked with my practitioner. He smiled, 
He said I should consider myself a kind of rock star because the damn headaches gave me a good excuse to get off work anytime I needed to. I like my GP. He's got my back. I explained how I didn't want to be off work and loved my job. I told my MD how getting out of the house helps me cope with my wife's bitter twins. He's aware how I don't trust those two simple bastards. My brand of headaches has been described as alarm clock headaches because of the way they startle you awake. There have been nights I don't get much sleep on purpose, just to avoid the auras and out-of-control migraines. Lately, I have been getting migraines during daylight hours. They have gotten so bad. I won't dare tell my physician, otherwise he might pull my driver's license. And what in the hell is all this sadness and anxiety I feel lately? This overcast of funk in my mental trunk. I have to get a handle on all of this shit. Command glued is the last thing I want or need. Divorce. I need to bring up that I don't want a divorce. They're driving me crazy. My third family. Plus, I'm good at avoiding confrontation, but with work and all, I've been too distracted. It's been pretty shitty lately. Recently, I've worked long hours just to avoid my miserable home life. Having two Charlie Manson 14-year-old clone twins doesn't help. Those little shits are intent on sabotaging my entire life. Ever since I married their mother five years ago, they have been committed to breaking this up. They want daddy back, the piss ants. I helped Helen get back child support a few years ago. Now I'm the enemy to her mongrel sons. The two teenage punks have been pissed off at me ever since. And what's up? Their old man abandoned them and doesn't pay a dime in child support. Still, they love him even more each day. They don't give a shit that their mother had to work two jobs just to keep them fed. And now, basically, they all live off of me. It's like having three botfly larvae under your skin. And that's pissing me off. And oh, did I tell you that the bitch, Helen, has been cheating on me while I'm away at work? That's why I enjoy my photography hobby so much gets me out of my skin, if only for a short while. Okay, so I do have a few reasons to be stressed. I arrive at my destination, this nearly falling, isolated two-story gothic Victorian on the way to Calusa, California. It's later than I planned. Darkness is clenching its fist around a bright orange pathetic ball that insists on imitating the setting sun. I'm off the clock, finally. It's me time. It's time to relax before it gets late and I drive back home to Sacramento some hundred nagging miles south on Highway 99. This frightening location is my new favorite photography hotspot. I set the emergency brake on my Highlander. I park it under a dead walnut tree. The wind and leaves, walnut hulls, tick, 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 of the roof and windshield. In fall, a storm is brewing. I scan the abandoned homestead and look for the obvious humankind or aliens. It looks untouched. It's all here the 1800s abandoned massacre site. I admire all the wooden, hollowed-out shells of architectural ghosts, the main two-story clapboard house, the shop, the garage, the shed. The beginning of icy rain slants into everything, everything in disrepair. The two floors Victorian reminds me of an old-world Portuguese sailing ship for some reason. 
It has the same salty wooden bone structure, a bow, a mizzen mast, and a stout stern. It is planked tongue and groove boarding that extends beyond the end of the broken railing. It appears as a cannonball softened ship, readied for mutineers on board. I imagine the second story balcony flooring is the ship's main deck. The entire homestead has a dark, mythical presence. If it were an authentic pirate ship, I am almost certain some king or queen would have ordered it to carry only the most deadly, darkest cargo, black sails over the restless seven seas. No one I've spoken to knows much about the abandoned 1800s Victorian farmhouse or outbuildings. Their reticence seems less about history than the superstition and folklore surrounding it. Folks in the area are from another time dimension. Their eyes are tongues. All they want to do is lick at you. Adjunct poverty. What can do that? There's something about this ancient place that gives me chicken skin. I've been here two other times. Each visit raises my hackles. Fear is the perfect photo I intend to capture. The transient darkness of life and death in the middle. Rumor has it, it's always been here. Ever since the slaughter. From what I glean, the house is still haunted. The photography group I joined on Facebook wants nothing to do with the old place. They warned me that it meant harm to me. They call it a paranormal entity, too risky to shoot. My obsession is to prove them all wrong or correct. I'm at the point in my life where it doesn't matter. I hate my life, my third family. I exit the Highlander, holding the parka's hood over the side of my face. The wind and rain sting my skin as I run. I hit the key fob and lock the car doors. There's a two-foot stump in front of an old set of wooden steps. The steps lead up to the arched doorway. There's a welcome mat in front of the door. The opening is ajar, lockless. A horseshoe turned upside down. Blackness greets me as I enter. I shake the water off my jacket as I look around. Everything is graying orange in the sun attempting to set through the crack between the sky and the horizon. The heavy rain-soaked clouds have nearly succeeded in drowning it out of sight. The broken windows welcome the impending blackness. Someone once looked after all this vintage decay, I mean. At least enough to prevent the outdoors from taking over and completely moving in. For the most part, the old residence has averted the temptation of vandals. Not one person has tossed a Molotov cocktail into the foyer in an attempt to unleash it. Gasoline fires never climb the stairs into the bedrooms. The large house's ethereal wooden bone structure and muscular anatomy look out of place in the region's landscape of double-wide trailers and bankrupt farmhouses. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm on edge. But that's what I love about the mysterious place. That's what I cherish in life, especially now. I'm a pressure cooker. Can you hear me hiss? Just listen. I'm an amateur photographer. It's not my job. I travel the state's Highway 20 for work. The state of California employs me. Property lines, encroachments. I settle almond and pecan quarrels. Trees don't give two shits about fences, but farmers do. And so it's my job to keep the regional ranchers and farmers from feuding and turning into the Hatfield and McCoys. It is a fences make good neighbors sort of thing. 
the plot boundaries that I verify prevent a righteous amount of shotgun blasts to the faces. I find that part of my job rewarding, but it's not my passion. Exploring and photography is my passion. I am employed as a land surveyor. It's the third time I've stopped by the old two-story to photograph its essence. My first visit to the rundown two-story house was three years ago. I've been in no hurry to return until now. This will make it my third visit, maybe my final one. It's not like nature will reclaim the damn abandoned place anytime soon. And after all, California is not the Amazon jungle, especially up here in Calusa County, where there are more crappy corn and bean fields than wild. I've taken my time about coming back here. Something feels ominous. But obsession is like a leaky faucet that doesn't want to fix a drip. What draws me in here? In part, it's the winters and summers and how they interact with the abandoned Victorian that is most attractive. All the decaying moodiness and slow burn corrosion. In truth, it's just another excuse so I can avoid Helen and her mongrel teens. Lately, I've wanted to get all the wolves on their asses. Jimmy, flipping me off the other day, almost got him eight fingers and a thumb. There aren't many outbuildings on the property, but they are all haunted. I'm digging the fallow garden on the anchorage. It once grew red tomatoes and radish, and now mostly a nutritional bounty of nothingness. Dude, there is this old chicken coop, too. It has a rotten floor part, earth now, sticky with mud and feathers, no matter what time of year. Attached to the wall, there's this built-in butcher's block. The beefy block sports a weathered surface, cracks and hatchet cuts. It was used to separate small farm animals from their heads. On the floor, next to the butcher's block, there's this hot dip galvanized bucket. It's rusted red now. I'm almost certain it caught a few dozen goats and sheep size. Innards, heart, lungs, gizzards. I'd say about ten pounds when filled with guts. There's a quintessential pet cemetery in the back of the dilapidated house. It sports 4-H crosses in the property's true northern corner. It was a corner where two fences once twisted rusty barbed wire together to help ward off evil as it flew in off the dead field toward the farmhouse. Witch weed as thick as livestock fur encircles the damn makeshift graveyard. Tumbleweeds dance just north of the barbed wires, tumbling, always tumbling. Aren't we all? The detached garage looks more like a motorcycle fix-em-up shop than a place to shelter a run-down family car a farmer can't afford. Its east wall is leaning in the direction anywhere the wind wants it to go. Maybe a struggling farmer or rancher greased tools under the patched-up roof. Perhaps they poured gas and diesel into cans, blood hung buck deer to the skin, butchered them good. What's left on the ground is greasy and splintered. It's a more chaotic slaughterhouse floor than two by twelve inch planks made to soak up penzoil. Through a shattered window in the house, you can see an old John Deere tractor. It insists on staying broken down by the house. It rests on what was a piss-colored lawn, now more weeds than failure. It looks so damn tired, the tractor, having been sold and resold. If it had a tongue, it would be hanging out, spent and dragging around its rusty old chisel plow. The old green John Deere surely has never been paid off. 
A lot of hungry farmers and bad crops thought of that. But the house itself, the dark Victorian, well, it's by far the most intriguing of all the skeletal remnants. If everything outside the vintage clapboard is dead antiquity, then everything inside the ghastly walls of the house includes ghosts with unfinished business. In my mind's eye, I can visualize them. The bloody ghosts, dressed to the hilt in their baroque Sunday suits and gowns as they swirl and whirl in the hollowed-out first-story great room. Some distance away from the front of the house, I can hear the occasional hiss of a car as it whizzes past the old farmhouse. Each vehicle is a mechanical blur, intent on getting out of the storm I'm in. Highway 20 connects the cities of Yuba and Calusa. The Calusa Highway runs east and west. The small town is called the Town of Levees by the locals. The levees were built strong to prevent flooding. Each levee a muscle shouldered the dirt against the wandering Sacramento River as it brutes itself toward the Pacific Ocean. My mind feels like it is flooding with anger for some reason. Out here, alone, I feel free. At least while I am in this abandoned house, I feel as though I am on the dark side of the moon. I'm thinking back to the first time I entered the house. Come along. I'd been careful not to fall through any of the rotten floorboards. It was over the holes in the decaying floor where the smell was worse. Moldy, corroding clothing appeared to be scattered about on the dirt, discarded and bloody. Dead animals, their skeletons under the house. I shot fisheye that night, for the first time. I shot fisheye that night, the first visit. I recall using my Canon EF-14mm F2L lens. In some house areas, the holes in the roof and ceiling lined up. It allowed me to shoot the stars against this foreboding backdrop of blackness. The precise framing added to the wonderful context of each photo. I completed the second one about a year after the first photo shoot. Back then, I focused on the home's massive fireplace, its hearth, the redwood mantle, what was left behind, and what might have been taken. The room felt possessed. I speculated that the round and oval water-damaged rings on the mantletop could have been from a small urn that once housed a dead somebody's ashes. I got hung up for the longest time about who'd want to take them. That second evening felt as if the old Victorian had dominated me around and shoved a lot of visually unsettling shit in my face. It was as if I was being led around by a photographic dominatrix. All the excitement had turned me into a photography camera slave during that particular shoot. I know it's sick, but I loved it. The living room was empty that early evening, except for an old high back chair in the fireplace. The chair was plush, or had been too expensive for the room. It was made of deep walled corduroy. It was maybe the most costly thing in the house. Cigarette burns pocked the stuffed arms, mostly the one on the right. That was where a heavy hand must have rested, I thought to myself. Someone or something tired and weary, or maybe angry, sat there. It was a resting place, where neglected ashes took away most of the expensive tobacco. The chair must have been the place where the master of the house contemplated too long, perhaps dozed off, not giving a shit about a fire. A troubled and weary mind can do that to you. 
Pain and anger can drown you in sleep. I know that. I sat in the chair. I became part of the chair. The master became part of me that second night. The chair felt out of place in the large room. A little stuffy for a skinny cattle rancher, a failed hog farmer who'd gotten too okay about drinking cheap whiskey and losing too many crops. Perhaps a man sat there? A man who'd gotten tired of making poor choices in life. Whoever sat in the chair in front of the snapping hickory fire more than likely wanted to be left alone the rest of his goddamn life. Evilness makes bad company anywhere it sits. I've always shared most of my photographs with my third wife and her two juvenile ferrets. The chair photos get most the attention of all the images I print at Walgreens and keep in the photo album on the coffee table in front of the big screen TV. My two stepsons, Beavis and Butthead, <laughs> rough up their voices over that one. The emotions I intend to generate by leaving the scarier photos on the coffee table are designed to invoke fear, but that hasn't worked. This evening, I intend to shoot the kitchen, having saved it last. Kitchens are a family's beehive of activity. They tell us so much about all the intricate dynamics of a family. I love feeling like a voyeur as I head to the heart of the house. I have no choice. My photo seductress is thrashing my ass with a black whip. She demands I move along quickly. She's hot. She tells me she's got some gorgeous photos waiting for me in the kitchen that they are to die for. I got something good and sexy for you, she laments. I situate myself. It's a magnificent kitchen. Lots of built-in cabinets and countertops. There's lots of broken cupboard space and broken china on the floor. Based on the look of the chipped paint on the walls, it's always been different shades of poor man white. As the last daylight, what enters muddies the kitchen colors into near obsidian. Darkness has let itself in through a veiled patch in the twelve-foot ceiling and roof in the kitchen. It has also seeped through the broken latticed kitchen window. Upgraded cabinet handles and drawer pulls grace the drawers and doors now rusted. Half of the fifties relics have been stolen and missing. Most drawer bottoms are pulled and cracked, unable to stash a clutch of silverware, set a farmer dull steak knives. Hulls of walnut shells litter the wooden counters, along with a ton of rat shit. It's easy to figure out that someone who had a lot of pent-up passion couldn't afford a butcher block. There's not an inch of flat surface in the kitchen that hasn't been slashed or chopped. Someone cut deep gashes into what was a large wooden table. It must have been while well using a hefty meat cleaver or large butcher knife. Possums and raccoons have made themselves comfortable, shitting all over the place, in the cabinets and on the shelves. Mice crap sprinkles the floor as thick as wedding rice. A massive latticed window graces the wall at the end of the kitchen, minus most of the glass. The window framework is fractured and splintered. The large family farm table's left leans next to the windowsill. Inside the kitchen, it feels like a meat locker. I cinch up the collar of my parka again. I carefully step around the holes in the cracked linoleum and decayed floorboards. Bent nails appear as barbed hooks. Snared at the tips is animal fur and bits of skin leather and unknown tissue. I attach the Nikon flash securely. I adjust the camera's settings to the aperture speed. 
I begin to capture my ghostly photos one flash at a time. It's in the kitchen where I feel this atmospheric pressure. It's a cloudy and murky mix of discourse and horror. I love my dominatrix for being so sadistic and forceful. Rose thorns begin to run through my veins. I continue to shoot with excitement. I begin to feel at one with the kitchen. I'm the dead center of a photographic autopsy. I take pictures to support my findings. I am hit with one of my auras, a halo of light out of the blue. It comes out of nowhere and everywhere. Is this a precursor to one of my crappy headaches? I say aloud. The decaying weather is demanding entrance into the kitchen space. The kitchen is evolving into a storm. A wintry jungle is beating its blustery war drums outside, bare branches against the outside wall from the skeleton of a dead maple tree. Torn window curtains flap and flag against the peeling wallpaper, just above the shredded wainscoting. I observe out the window. The lightning strikes are moving closer. Each strike is an alien entity intent on walking toward me. Aliens that use electrical stilts quicken their pace in my direction. I hear the sizzling and frying sound. The smell of burnt flesh is unmistakable. The kitchen cupboards rattle like sabers in battle. A failed cupboard hinge gives way, axing its damaged door to the floor. Active lightning enters the butcher shop. It falls to the floor and somehow keeps triggering. My camera flash is pulsating napalm. In the middle of all the light and sparks, I can see what appears to be a man's arm. The arm is covered in dirt and sweaty blue denim. It thrusts downward in a vicious arc over and over again. The flesh is tearing. Bacon is being sliced and pigs are squealing. Rain and cast-off spatter the entire kitchen red. My migraine is a locomotive. It's a locomotive dragon. It runs over me, and when it's done, I can hear its tail whip past my head. After the blast of lights shuts off, the room is noiseless. My breathing is labored. I fear that my vision won't reappear. Instantly. I am violently thrown to the floor. I'm not sure how, but the farmhouse tells me to kill, kill, kill. Yet, another voice says you don't have to do this. As soon as I regain my vision, I stand and haul ass in the direction of the front door. To hell with any notion of a broken leg or neck if I happen to slip down a random rabbit hole. I exit the two-story farmhouse, nearly tripping down the broken steps to the ground. I'm done with the bloody farm. For good, I tell myself. So long, bitch, I yell at the house behind me. I quickly get into my Highlander. I lock the doors. I'll be damned if I regress and let this emotional train wreck get the best of me. I've worked too hard in therapy over the years. All the medication, mindfulness... You name it. One thing about an anxiety attack, it usually has an ending. I keep promising myself that over and over again. I use one of the paper bags I keep in my cubby hole. As I slowly breathe in and breathe out, the panic ebbs. Next, I use the empty sack and my extra sweatshirt to wipe down the window fog. When I turn on the air conditioner, it helps to clear away the remaining humidity just for a minute. Outside, all I see is bad weather and dead trees whisking in the fierce wind. A walnut tree branch falls onto the hood of my rig. To hell with the dent, I release the emergency brake. Thunder and lightning shuffle the icy layers of wet sky. 
I power in reverse and quickly spin into a U-turn. Easing up to the highway, I look both ways and inch onto Highway 20 in the direction of Yuba City and home. In the rear view, my new camera flash continues to trigger in the kitchen. I intend to keep all this crazy shit to myself. Besides, who in the hell would believe me? My family already thinks I am eccentric and C-R-U-E-L. I whisper, Goodbye, ghosts. You can keep my new flash. I say farewell to the final horror shit show. Just wait and see. I hate King Burger and the freakish fast food mascot. But tonight, it's the only restaurant open in Yuba City near State Highway 99. I pull in. It's midnight sharp. My gluttonous hunger must be some kind of sign. Good. The lights are on, I tell myself. For some reason, I'm starving for a few shitty cheeseburgers and some fries. I clean up my face and hands in the car. It's difficult, but the alcohol wipes come in handy. There's always filthy Burger King restroom with the scent of piss in the grout if I need to wash clean. One of the two boys behind the counter greets me and takes my order. The teens shuffle like zombies. They appear to have been in a street fight. Black eyes, cut lips. Their shirt collars are up, over their throats. They seem to be hiding something. After I swipe my card, I search for an out-of-the-way booth in the back to gorge my anger away. I'm not in the mood for small talk, even though the place is empty. I wait, fumble around with the camera, and glare in amusement at my fresh farm photos. The server arrives. She says, here you go, sir. Hot fries from hell. I look up. She's an older woman with sunken, bloodshot eyes. Her appearance is Charles Manson witchy. Why are you open so late? I ask. She asks me, late? Like I should know something. Yes, late, I say. She tells me it's never too late, sir. She's asking me not to do it, or whatever the hell it is. The older woman is wearing a uniform and a strange necklace. Her necklace looks like a thick scar. She crackles. She's snarky. She makes fun over my shoulder. Each of my photos is white, flash white. She asks if I've been out at the old farmhouse and says it really doesn't matter now. What? I ask in shock. Did I ask you a question? Does she say, Kevin, got wax in your ears? Does she want to know if I've been to the farmhouse? I look down. Get ready to tell her to take a hike. I look up. She's gone. Jesus, it's freezing in here. BK must have turned on the conditioner to freshen up the place. With every breath, I see a plume of condensation. The mist quickly thickens in the frigid air. My teeth begin to chatter out of control. I gulp down the burger, fries, and coke. When I get up to leave, I walk back to the front of the place. I feel bad about not offering the older woman a tip. Behind the register, there is no one left behind the register except the full-size cutout the one and only Freaky Burger King. I flip him off and place the five dollar tip on the counter. I head for the exit door. Before I open it, I hear this witchy voice again in my mind. Kevin, you don't have to do this, it asks. When I turn around, everything inside is a sun flare. I squeeze the Highlander's key fob to unlock it as I run toward my car. The doors chirp open. Before I get in, 
I look back again at the planet Burger King. Inside the building, one after the other, the lights click off, row after row, until it's darkness. After I release the emergency brake and speed south towards Sacramento's home, I notice the parking lot lights shut off in the rear view. Row one, and then two, three, and four. In the sticky tar of early morning, I speed south on Highway 99. I'm spent. I lock my eyes on the blacktop. In some strange way, I regret going home. I worry about how my symptoms can mimic a brain aneurysm or other neurological disease. Hurt, pain, and worry begin to wash their dirty laundry in my mind. They all rinse and repeat. High beams approach me from the opposite direction on the narrow highway. They streak past me too close. I imagine death, instant death, so close yet far away. It's one burst of light after the other. I begin to feel angry and resentful. In my thoughts, it's as if something is taking over the silicone chips and solid-state circuitry. I whip the Highlander off the highway and onto the beginning of a dark country road. This road, 27. At the first gravel turnout, I pull in and skid to a stop. Inhale. Exhale. I say out loud. My head is rattling like my ex-mother-in-law's horrid pressure cooker. I'm certain it's going to explode. I'm sorry, I shout to every last one in my dark thoughts. I grip the steering wheel with all my strength. I begin smashing my head against the steering wheel over and over again until it feels good. Dig my fingernails into its leathery hide. I glance in the rear view. Who are you? I ask. No one answers. I gaze into the mirror as the horror of it all begins to run the red lights through the intersections of my synapse. Terrible thoughts, hijack thinking. She lied. Said size doesn't matter. Your stepsons need braces. Kevin, I'm sorry, Kevin. There are pending layoffs. I love you like a meal ticket, Kevin. It's too difficult to love you. I wish you were more like Kyle, my ex. You aren't my real father, Kevin. Shove it. Kevin, I'm writing an RX for a new medication. Why did you quit wearing your wedding ring? There, out in the darkness, I can see a glint of lightning in the distance. Is walking in my direction. It's stainless steel bright with sharp serrated edges. I can hear the thunder in my gut and feel its ungodly release. Calmness washes over me as I await the storm. It arrives just in time before Kevin disappears. Once in the driveway at home, it notices that every light in the house is on. It is anger. Inside the TV is running full blast. It is a headache. The boy's dog they just had to have is cowering in a corner. Sammy's crapped and pissed up the hallway carpet. Next to the pizza box on the kitchen counter are several sharp knives. Under one of the blades, a fly is attempting to die with all the grace it can muster. It picks up the knife with its right hand, exposing the fly. It mercy kills the fly with its left thumb. The blade glints from all the lights they always forget to turn off. The longest knife rings and tings while being lifted. It walks to its favorite chair. Someone spilled a coke on the seat and left the can half-crushed. Next, it boots up YouTube on the TV screen. 
It clicks on his favorite white noise channel. It turns the volume up high. The living room is all light and hiss. Every damn thought in its head doesn't belong to him. When I was a kid, I loved the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. It thumbs the blade of the tempered steel knife. Perfectly sharp, it thinks. Rock, paper, scissors, it whispers softly. Pizza, fly, knife, it says almost in a hush. Pizza, fly, knife, it says loudly. Silence, and then more silence engulf the house. It stands, shaking. It is a madman. It grips the knife firmly by its handle. At the top of its lungs, it shouts, Pizza! Fly! Death! Only then does it recall what the Burger King server said. You don't have to do this, Kevin. You don't have to do this. It's too damn late, witch! I did it last night! It screams. There's not an inch inside the house that rusty red is not sprayed the next day. YouTube fades to black on the big screen TV. It disappears forever, too. The end. I hope you enjoyed Migraine, as written by Dan A. Cardoza and voiced by Nick Goroff. You can find more by author Dan A. Cardoza's work right here on our website, creepypastastories.com, by searching Cardoza. That's C-A-R-D-O-Z-A. While there, check out his Amazon page, featuring his newest literary release, Burn Bear. Here's a synopsis. We all have one, believe it or not. A burn barrel. In it, we stoke what we assume to be harmful, used up in broken things, just out of reach, dreams that never made it, nightmares that insist on haunting us, things that go bump in the night. What we place in the burn barrel, we command to pray at the altar of flames. Enjoy literary horror at its finest and check it out today. Voice actor and 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel as well, as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his own YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. If you do drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here. Our second tale of the evening is written by Mark Toes and performed by Olivia Steele and Nick Gora. All marriages have their secrets, and if this next tale tells us anything, it's especially the ones you least expect. Now, without further ado, I present to you Nocturnal Pursuits of the Elderly. Saturday night. It seemed to take forever to come around. I can hardly bear it. My head buzzing like a kid on Christmas Eve, goosebumps dancing across my leathery skin. Usual time, pet? Please, dear, and don't forget to feed Alfred. Never do, dear, never do. Now off you fuck, darling. And there's some quiche wrapped in the fridge, Marty. Needs eating? Quiche my arse. Kiss my arse. I'm just a child wrapped in a silly old costume. Yes, dear. Now go on. The bridge crowd will be waiting. I'll get at least three hours with her. Perhaps more. She steps out of the car and leans over, giving me her gummy smile. Who'd have thought someone could get so giddy 
over a couple of glasses of cheap wine and a game of cards. Have fun, love, I say. Don't get too wild. It made her day when they let her join a few years ago. Picky, apparently, about who they let in. I've only ever met John. Installed the security system and sensors throughout both houses. Shy as a schoolgirl, he was. Nice enough, I suppose. Ah, there she goes. My dearest Susan. As she hobbles up the driveway, I offer a wave. Her oversized handbag clutched between her knobbly fingers. It doesn't get out much, bless her. And happy wife, happy life, and all that. Forty years on Tuesday, and the majority of them are peaceful. And we're off. It's hard adhering to speed limits when urgency flows through your veins, but I don't like to tempt fate. These nights are special, ones to be savored, and every second counts. I wind the window down, enjoying the breeze and the smell of the night that fills me with nostalgic melancholy. Long summer evenings on our bikes, legs going like the clappers as though we could escape the inevitability of darkness. I offer a commemorative howl to the already visible larger-than-life three-quarter moon. Damn, I love Saturdays. Forecaster said there's a heat wave coming, but for now, coolness caresses me, going some way to calm my nerves. Sinatra sings his smoothness on the radio, too, but some punk DJ with no right to fade the master out starts spitting out words, spreading mold. So much bad news. Local politicians and their barefaced lies. Homeless numbers going through the roof. An influx of drugs in the area. And beware, the full moon killer is still at large and will likely strike again next week. Please make sure you report any suspicious behavior to your local police station. Have a pleasant evening, friends. The changeover track kicks in. Some one-hit wonder from the 80s. As I roll up the driveway, Alfred spies me, immediately starting to rub himself against the door, tail eloquently swishing with expectation. Susan's pride and joy. Fur as soft as the night sky, but a privileged little fucker that I have no time for. Put a cat flap in the tradesman entrance, but the stupid little hairy bastard still insists on using the front door. I get out of the car and breathe in most of the evening, offering next door's bedroom window a glance, prompting a shudder to run down my spine. Ah, to be young again. Get out of it, I say, sweeping my foot across the front step, just missing Alfred's behind. He retreats behind Susan's graying, horned statue of whatever the fuck that is. But by the time I close the door, his distorted and annoying face is back at the frosted glass, offering a forgiving and hopeful meow. Go play with traffic! We've lived here for over 30 years now. Back in 97, we decided to split the house and rent the next door out. We figured it would be worth the initial cost if we could get a decent turn, and being a builder myself, we came well within budget. We even converted both lofts into makeshift studios, skylights and all. Best decision we ever made. Taking some financial pressure away and meaning we could retire early. It gave me a whole new lease on life, too. Walking almost too fast for my arthritic legs, I head towards the kitchen and grab the quiche from the fridge. Quiche, my arse. Guilt? A little. But 
We've all got our skeletons, secret fantasies, dark areas of our minds that only we have the map to. And don't come over all innocent with me. Here you go, you little shit, I say to Arthur, sliding a generous slice across the step. A word of this to Susan, I'll fuck you up, okay? Alfred meows and strokes himself against me like a two-bit male hooker. Glad we understand each other. Now eat the shitty quiche. I can't even remember telling her that I liked it, but I don't have the heart to tell her I don't. Almost falling up the stairs, my breathing becomes fast and erratic, accompanied by a stirring down below and an involuntary squeal. In our bedroom, the familiar heavy scent of my wife's body butter awaits, as does the obscene number of illuminated amateur sculptures on the corner dressing table, the ones she makes in the studio. Half human, half animal. All garbage. Still, as I work at the secret panel of the closet, my adrenaline overrides anything but thoughts of my Charlotte. There she is. Beautiful. As I squeeze myself into it, limb by limb, the PVC suit squeaks its indecent soundtrack until finally I begin zipping it up over my belly. Gloves next, and now the leather mask. Alas, I am a creature of the night, invisible, stealthy, leaving no trace. I am charged, but feel the need to remind myself a costume is just a costume as I stagger down the stairs. There's even a temptation to jump the last few, as I used to, when my legs were more than just solidified dust. But thoughts of Susan coming home and finding me broken at the bottom of the steps, head to toe in leather, dissuade flight. I doubt she would believe I was playing at being Batman. A cold draft swallows me as I open the basement door, bringing with it a sharpness of alcohol. The only other hobby of mine... I flick on the light and carefully navigate the concrete steps, running my leather-clad fingers across the smoothness of the stone. Beetroot, turnip, celery. It's incredible what you can make good wine from. Susan's not a fan of the stuff, but I think it's healthy to have different interests, especially when there's an empty nest. She's got her bridge club, her pottery, and plenty of books about gemstones, animals, even those weird ones under the bed that she thinks I don't know about. I like making liquor, and, well, let's call them after-hours pursuits. The space always feels bigger than it is. Likely down to what I know, or possibly just the airiness of it. I added alcoves into the wall as a nice touch, a couple of my latest batch sitting proudly within them. Always takes a few tries to locate. Come on, where are... The secret door swings inward, revealing the almost empty utility shelf on the other side. I put it together before... Handing over the keys, thought it a nice little touch or additional peace of mind. It's been standing for over two decades now. Just another example of my craft. One more screw and... There we go. Clear. And into the makeshift laundry that I helped do the plumbing for. I recall how grateful she was at the time. Said I was a genius. Giddy with anticipation, I make my way up the steps. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. And with a satisfying click of the handle, I'm in. It's a strange and familiar feeling that washes over me. A euphoric combination of anticipation, desire, and homeliness. Everything is different. Softer. Like a mini-vacation to somewhere new. 
Much more than voyeurism. We have a special bond. I've spoken to her, made her laugh, fixed the downstairs toilet, mowed her lawn, even poured her a glass of beetroot wine on her patio. I feel part of her life, breathing in her air, inhaling her molecules of perfume, a light and seductive concoction that tickles the back of my throat. This is more like a relationship, you see. I'm the man of this... these houses. You may mock, but I have even seen her play with her hair when she talks to me, the blood rushing to her face. See the losers she dates, too. Nowhere near good enough for her. One guy lasted a few months, but I soon put paid to that sneaking into the bedroom on three occasions and cleaning out his wallet. Pissed all over the bathroom floor, too. There's a new guy on the scene now, but he won't last, not if I have anything to do with it. He's only stayed over three times that I know of, but that's more than enough. I dropped into town last week and picked up a lacy pair of red panties, now, if they should accidentally happen into the pocket of his overly tight pants? The giant television screen casts my glossy and smooth reflection as I flop into the couch. Perhaps it's why I like wearing the extra skin, to cover the imperfections that age brings and to match the youthfulness of my mind and all the desires that refuse to relent. I've still much to offer. Susan marks back my advances. Just because I'm getting on a bit doesn't mean I don't have urges. That said, it's never my wife I imagine below me. Always Charlotte. Her low-cut dress up to her waist, hands on my buttocks, bringing me into her. Make love to me, Marty. Make me feel... Love should have no boundaries, age or otherwise. And it is love. I know it is. We do it properly. I'd tell Susan first, and then we could escape to the country and stay in a and b for a while until we decided the next steps. Just keep telling yourself that, Marty. I reached over tonguing the rim of the wine glass smeared with lipstick before sipping some of the remaining wine and swirling it around in my mouth. Earthiness, cherries, raspberries. It's a Pinot Noir. Not top shelf, but none of that cheap crap either. I could teach her about wine. We could spend the weekend in France, the country of love where anything goes. No boundaries left to be broken. As I push myself up, I notice three boxes in the corner of the room and make my way over. One has the word charity scrawled across the side, full of clothes, ornaments, DVDs. The other two are unmarked and full of books, everything from Twilight to Dale Carnegie. I guess she must be having a clear-out of sorts. Untidiness greets me in the kitchen. Lots of stuff scattered across the counter. Sometimes I do a bit of clean-up, not being a fan of slovenliness, but it all depends on how the night rolls. There's nothing much of interest in the fridge, though I can't resist fingering a dollop of cream from the mini birthday cake. Thirty-two candles squished in there. Someone having a shitty sense of humor. I wrote her a poem for her birthday, and I'll read it to her one day. The smell of perfume gets even stronger as I make my way up the stairs. No need to avoid the creak of the fourth step. That's only a factor when she's still in the house. I must admit, those visits are becoming more regular, but before you start judging, I don't get up to no funny business. I just sit in the plush chair, watching and listening, the gentle rise and fall of her smooth chest, little moans as she changes position. Okay, 
Once I did climb onto the bed, nestling behind her, inhaling and sucking on strands of her long brown hair. I didn't feel so good about it, though. Drew a line, right there and then. I'm not one of those pervert types, I assure you. As I cross the threshold to her bedroom, I'm transported to that now familiar and different world, a mellow heaven full of dizzying scents. Oh, Charlotte. I pull back the sheets of the bed, take off my mask, and pull the zipper of the suit down, finally letting myself fall into the softness, my tongue lapping at the linen, my bare chest slaking across her nest. Drawing back the sheets over my shoulders, I continue to squirm with delight, imagining her naked form doing the same. Nearly five years strong now. I knew you were the one. The others meant nothing. Fell in love with you as soon as I saw you, my dear Charlotte. As I said, I'd leave Susan for her if that's what it came down to. Forty years of marriage just for one night with my true love. My eyes fall across the linen basket. I try. I really do. Each Saturday night, as I return home, I convince myself never again. But the pull is strong. It's not just a sexual thing. It makes me feel closer to her. The smell and taste lingering long after I remove the panties from around my face. I'm not a pervert. Besides, nothing should be forbidden between the lovers. I remove the ones shoved down the side of the suit, sliding them into the edge of the basket and collect the fresh ones. Almost immediately, I feel the blood running to my the fuck? Headlights leak through the window, the accompanying engine louder still. No, that can't be. She's never home before eleven. Breath held, I run to the window, my heart pounding as I watch Charlotte's ten-year-old Audi come to a halt, a small rental van pulling close behind. Shit! Doors open, voices emerge. Him. It's him with the tidy hair and the tight arse who normally rolls up in the Mercedes. I'll never make it. I watch them embrace and kiss, my grip on the panties tightening. This isn't right. As they make their way to the door, I search the room, opting for the closet regretting it immediately, cursing myself for having no contingency plan. I feel like a sitting duck in a PVC suit. Fuck it all. I hear laughter and the creak of the fourth step. It will be dark soon, she says. We should make a start. It's all about the preparation, Charlie. Slowly, softly, catchy monkey. Charlie. That's not her fucking name, Bozo. I press my back against the wood of the closet, sliding a dress across for further concealment. They're in the bedroom now, undressing. This is a fucking nightmare. The love of my life and him. She doesn't even notice the unmade bed as she's thrown across it. He drops to his knees, wrestling with her panties. Tainted, those. No good to me. Please let this end. He goes in for the kill, feasting on her deliciousness. The full course. Not just an appetizer. I fucking hate him. The noises. Christ, the noises. I squirm against the wood, holding my breath at the accompanying squeak, but I don't think they notice. Suddenly, I wish I was playing bridge. Anything but this. He moves on top of her, wrapping his mouth around her now-exposed nipple. I 
I still love you, Charlotte. We'll fix this. His pants dropped to the floor, and the shirt, pink briefs. What the fuck is this? His moans get louder, breathing too, and soon he's thrashing into her as though she's a sack of potatoes. Don't know what that means, but it all looks so demeaning. I can't watch. It's too much. Reciprocating the groans, poor Charlotte does her best to pretend she's enjoying it, but how could she be? I edge forward, sliding my feet to the front of the closet. It has to be smooth, or the game is up. The bed begins to shake wildly, scraping against the wall. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, Charlotte, why do you cheapen yourself? Three, bang, two, bang, one. I make my move, wincing at the feedback from my athletic legs as I drop to the floor and scramble toward the crumpled heap of clothes. Shoving the black panties in my mouth, I slip my hand in my suit and pull out the red ones. Here goes nothing, I think sliding them into Lover Boy's pocket. Her moans grow louder still as she does her best to keep him happy. Why, Charlotte? Why? Time to go. Crossing over the threshold into the hallway, I get to my feet with a grimace and glance over my shoulder only to see them still entwined in debauchery. Like fucking animals they are. Now that's not love. Where's the tenderness? And so much for slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. He's going at her like a jackhammer. I slide the stolen bandies up into my suit and zip up, wondering what happened to real love. As I close the basement door, I catch my breath and begin to cry. We'd be happy. I know it. Susan? I love her too. Just in a different way. Besides, she shows the cat more affection than me. I get lonely, see. Now, I might be over the hill. My face wearing life and too much sun, but I still miss the tender touch of a female. Making my way up my basement steps, I bring the panties to my face and inhale. All is well until visions of them invade my head, tainting those sheets I was nestled within only a few minutes ago. And under my roof! I pause halfway up, feeling lightheaded and out of breath. Their groans in my head bouncing around just like the bed. Bang, bang, bang. It's enough to drive a man insane. Inhale. Just a mistake. We all make mistakes. She'll regret it in the morning. Inhale. It's a relief to close the basement door behind me. Inhale. I pour myself a whiskey and slump into the living room couch. Unzipping and rubbing the panties across my chest, sliding them slowly downwards. Still so early. Fuck! I'm aroused, but can't bring myself to do it. He's in my head. The fucker. The neat-haired, tight-arsed fucker. She's moving out. My Charlotte is leaving me. And without so much as a word, I know we shouldn't have let her pay by the month. And after a couple more whiskeys, I hear voices and move toward the bay window, watching them as they carry some of her things into that shitty little van, finally driving off into the distance. Oh, Charlotte. Angrily, I wrap the panties around my head and fall onto the couch, sobbing. 
another whiskey, another. Finally, the tidal wave of exhaustion approaches. It takes a while to realize what's going on. A blue flashing to my left prompts me to reach out, knocking the tumbler to the ground. Shit, fuck. Hello? Ah, shit. I aim for the green button again. Hello? It's me, Marty. It's 10.30. Where are you? I am so sorry, love. I fell asleep. I'll be there in five. Can't you wait inside? Yes. Okay. I'm on my way. Sorry, love. Yes, I, I said I'm sorry. Fuck it, duck. On my second attempt, I thrust myself from the couch towards the door. And it's not until I'm halfway down the driveway, I realize I'm leather clad with panties stuck to my face. Fuck it to hell and back. Snapping my head up and down the street, I rush inside and slam the door behind me. Come on, come on. It takes what feels like inhuman strength to peel off the suit, and by the time I'm out, I'm dripping with sweat and can hardly breathe. Worst night ever. Using the banister, I drag myself upstairs and shove the PVC costume back behind the panel. But true love never runs smooth, I keep telling myself. The same temptation to jump the stairs washes over me as I slip an arm through my shirt. Finally, I'm out the door, decent but exhausted and heartbroken. Cool evening air rushes through the window, but I have the smell of sweaty PVC in my nostrils. Fortunately, Susan couldn't smell a fart if it slapped her on both cheeks. Traffic lights blur, the dotted white line becoming one as I drive slightly over the speed limit. A first for everything, but I hate to think of her standing outside on her own. She's still my Susan. There she is. I give her a flash, and she offers a wave and a smile. God bless her. Good night, love. Have you been crying? No, it's the wind. Was it fun? Always. She says, fixing her hair in the mirror. Did you enjoy the piece? I did up to a point, I reply, pulling away. And then I started missing you. Liar. Is that whiskey on your breath? Just a little hot toddy, love, I reply, noticing how strongly I'm gripping the wheel. How is everyone? Very well. She winds the window down and swallows the breeze. They always ask after you. I clear my throat. Saw a removal van next door tonight. Hasn't even given notice. Charlotte? Oh, she came to see me last week. Moving in with that man with the tidy hair. But they've only been out a few times. I lower my tone. Young and stupid, eh? She seems quite smitten. She reaches for my hand and squeezes. I said I'd go and give her a hand on Tuesday. Make the tea, help her organize. Her man is out of town, coming down with the truck on Wednesday morning. I'm her man. But Tuesday's our anniversary. Well, you'll just have to cancel those tickets for Paris you booked then, won't you? Besides, I've organized a little shindig for us in the evening... I think it's about time you met the bridge club. Nothing fancy, just some wine, canapes. Uh, Jennifer said- Her words grew distant, my mind back on Charlotte, full of nostalgic melancholy, memories of our times together, all playing to a soundtrack of pained voices and heartbreaking chords. Part of me is tempted to say I'll go with her to help Charlotte. But I know it would be too much. Just the thought of saying goodbye. Ugh, this is unbearable. I spend the rest of the night trying to hide my sadness, but I know Susan picks up on it. I expect an inquisition, but she just keeps looking at me and smiling. God bless her. The next couple of days continue much the same way. 
I do my best, but sometimes I have to leave the room, biting on my lip to fight back the tears. Susan leaves me be, but I know she'd be there for me if needed. By the time Tuesday comes around, I've written 13 poems and a top 40 list of the saddest songs from my LP collection. Oh yes, it hits hard, and not just in terms of the heat. Through the bay window, I see Charlotte's brown curls and the smile across her face that I know won't last. She slams the car door shut and all but skids toward the front door, disappearing behind the hedgerow. Going over there now, love, Susan says from the front of the house. There's another quiche for you on the top shelf of the fridge. Oh, and listen out for the door, will you? Poor fucking Alfie. Wait, how long are you planning? The door slams shut. Christ, the thought of facing guests is unbearable. All the fake smiles and superficial chatter when my heart is bleeding. I spend the day alternating between pacing the room and flopping on the couch, occasionally picking up the crossword and just staring at it. She's in my head. The scent, the smile, the laughs, the panties. And I'm even too heartbroken to consider pleasuring myself. I have no appetite either, but I make sure Alfred gets a generous slice of the sloppy mess in the fridge just because I hate him so fucking much. Early afternoon already. What the hell are they doing across there? I take to pacing again, thinking back to the time we spent together in the dark. Moonlight falling across her cheek. Oh, how I long to kiss those soft and youthful lips, slide my fingers into the negligee and caress her warmth. I'm a hopeless romantic, nourished on thoughts of walks on the beach and rolling in the sand. Another bout of tears threatens to release, and I curl my fingers into a fist. Tomorrow she will be out of my life for good. The afternoon is swallowed by a black hole of grief and despair, the eventual knock at the door tempting me to scramble behind the couch. But I know Susan has gone to some trouble, and that somehow I need to snap myself out of this stupor and stop being so damn selfish. I open the door to four of the dullest-looking wrinklies I've ever seen, two men, two women. It looks as though they were all made from the same mold. Pale and graying skin, downturned mouths, prominent hanging jowls, and eyes like flooded marsh ground. Christ, is this what I look like to Charlotte? Hello. But nobody replies. They just shuffle past me, little bags in one hand and a covered serving dish in the other which they place on the table as they pass. Mouth agape, I watch them continue trudging through the living room and begin lining up outside the basement door like albino lemmings. Excuse me, I say, but another tap of the door steals my attention. More of them. Another six clones. All with little bags and more dishes. I recognize John at the back of the group, only because of the twitch in his right eye. John? Marty? It's an absurd situation, and my head, already in bits, struggles to comprehend any of it. Before I can even string a sentence together, my phone begins to vibrate. Susan? What the hell is... Yes, ten of them. What? I'm not in the mood for this, Susan. Please tell me what is happening. Yes, of course I love you. Yes, I trust you. Oh, Christ. Oh, fuck. How... How did you know? Look, pet, I... No. I don't know it came... What? You can't be serious. Susan, I... All right, all right. Yes, I'll do it. Okay. I'll see you in an hour. Shit.
Drone number one turns the handle, and the others follow him down into the basement. As the last grey face crosses the threshold into my other world, I replay the conversation with Susan in my head. She knows about the suit. How? And what's all this about an anniversary present? I follow the already flattened tread in the carpet, performing more laps, occasionally stopping to fill my tumbler with whiskey, and eventually scampering upstairs to wrestle with the suit. It takes an eternity in the heat to squeeze into it. What the fuck is going on? Everything seems so futile now. My Charlotte is leaving me, but this... This is the icing on the cake. How can I ever look my wife in the eye? The phone rings again, and I tentatively answer it, feeling as though I may internally combust at any moment. Yes, dear. Okay, dear. On my way, dear. The excitement I usually feel walking down these stairs is replaced with trepidation and an ominous sense of finality. Susan and her friends have trespassed into my world, and I'm about to establish why. I reach the last few steps to see the secret door already ajar, and the shelf on the other side unscrewed and slid across. How the hell did she know? Susan? As I walk through into next door's basement, I get a faint whiff of familiarity. A heavy concoction of spice and smoke. And is that music? Ascending the concrete steps towards the warm yellow light makes my stomach churn. If she knows about the door... Susan? At the top of the stairs, the music is louder still. Susan! I approach the ever-increasing noise, noting the gemstones trailing up the stairs. And what's that? It sounds like moaning, or muffled cries. Legs feeling like lead weights, I take the steps one by one, my nostrils filling with more of that heavy sweetness. Susan! I notice the ladder to the attic pulled down, and the gentle sway of the ceiling light. More prolonged groans emerge. And what the hell is that slapping sound? I arch my neck to see the shifting light, assuming it to be a candle flame. Susan! My heart pounds as I clasp my hands around the cold steel. One step at a time, I begin the ascent. Blood pounding in my ears, almost surprised my legs support me. Above me, heavy breathing, squeaking, squelching, pounding. An acrid, sweaty smell begins to fall across me, above and beyond what was there before. Something horrible lies beyond that rectangular portal. I know it. Finally, I emerge, almost losing my footing as I take in the savagery surrounding me. I see a lion, deer, cat, panther, leopard... Even a fucking lobster, grunting, thrusting, bending, twisted jungle of surrealness coming at me from all directions. I place my hands down for balance, wincing at the touch of the cold plastic that appears to run the loft's full length. There only, I imagine, to catch whatever juices drip. Happy anniversary, my wife says between pants. But I haven't a clue which one she is. Your presence in the corner. What the fuck is going on, Susan? Oh, come on, Marty. She says, ripping the cat mask off. I should have guessed. We've all seen what you get up to after lights out. What? What are you talking about? Oh, Christ. She knows it all. But how? Nocturnal pursuits. Her niggers stuffed in your mouth, running around her bedroom dressed in leather, beating your dress like Tarzan. They all take a break from their groaning to cackle in unison. It's okay though, dear. She continues. We like what we like. The lion behind carries on, offering a roar. 
How... how did you... Cameras all over, dear. Courtesy of John when he did the alarm. You can't be too careful in a neighborhood like this. Her comments prompt more laughter. The lion is now no longer a lion. Back to a pale-faced, twitching drone sporting a tail, sweat dripping down his cheeks and splashing against the plastic sheet. Hi, Marty, he says. Is this what you want, Susan? For me to dress up like a fucking animal? She looks me up and down and smiles. I've decided I want to share this with you, Marty. The others weren't sure about letting you in, said we should both have our own interests, but I think this might be good for us. Exciting. We can go out with a bang, fuck like we did in the old days. A different sort of cry emerges from Binder, and I heave myself up, weaving my way between the animals towards the back of the room. Charlotte? She's bound to the radiator. Someone's gigantic Y fronts shoved down her throat. She looks at me with pleading eyes, mascara running down both cheeks. My Charlotte. I crouch down, running my fingers through her hair, goosebumps prickling my skin within a skin. Her eyes are glassy and delayed. I know how much you like this one, Susan says pulling herself away from the lion-lemming hybrid. She holds her back as she creases toward the floor and picks up a knife. Happy anniversary, she says, offering me the handle and a peck on the cheek. I drop my gaze to the trembling blade. What am I supposed to do with this? Full moon, Marty. It's a special night, made even more special by our anniversary. The group has accepted you into the flock. Everything is aligned. You want me to use this on her? Full moon killer still at large. Nourish yourself, feed on her blood, and forever mortalize your bond. She's our sacrifice to the animal gods. All those books under her side of the bed. The ones on animal worship and ancient rituals. All those Twisted fucking things staring at us under the moonlight. People don't get away with stuff like this. His fingerprints are on the knife, Marty. They're everywhere. We've already sent a message from her phone saying she no longer believes him about the panties. Nice touch. This is insane. He's on his way. At least two hours to go. And we're all each other's alibi. Bridge and I at our house. Full spread, the works. Just old codgers enjoying what time is left, having our night disturbed by the shouting and screaming next door. I feel young again. A kid on a dare. Full of adrenaline. And this woman, this stranger, I can't help feeling like I'm falling in love. And you do this every week? We only kill on a full moon, Marty. She smiles. Mostly the homeless, druggies... Street filth. Rest of the time, we fuck like animals. I lean in towards Charlotte, inhaling her hair and perfume, but there's a residue of something else. Of him. Said she was relieved to be moving. My wife says. Said that she didn't feel safe here anymore. Things moving, going missing. Sometimes as though she was being watched. Said the area was going downhill too. I guess that's gratitude for you. Charlotte issues uh, another muffled please, but Susan's words have me reeling. Everything I did for her, the chores, tidying up, putting in the security system to keep her safe. I feel cheated, let down, used. Regardless, I lean in, the salty sweat of her forehead soaking into my thin, dry lips. Our first proper kiss, and I know, our last. But all I can think of is the trouble Susan has gone to. For me. And all I got her was a box of chocolates and a shitty card. I don't know what to say, Suze. 
You're welcome, my wife replies, as I slide the knife an inch deep into Charlotte's chest, and as her muffled cries heighten to a sobbing crescendo, I feel charged, horny beyond belief. Blood cascades between us, and I rub it frantically across my face and chest and lick it from her wound. Soon the others join, like animals at a watering hole, lapping up the liquid, fighting for the best spot. Writhing on the floor, Charlotte reaches out to me. But our fling is over. I have a marriage to work on, and she can watch for a change. Thirst quenched. I borrow Pasty's mane to attend to my wife in the corner with as much vigor as I can manage for a man of sixty-seven. It turns out, I am a cat person after all. Go again, Susan? As she purrs, I howl at the moon, framed in the skylight. I hope you enjoyed Nocturnal Pursuits of the Elderly, as written by Mark Toes and performed by Olivia Steele and Nick Goroff. You can find more by author Mark Toes' work on our website, creepypastastories.com, by searching Toes. That's T-O-W-S-E. While there, check out his Amazon page, featuring his newest literary release, Nature's Perfume. Four close friends arrange a trip to the Amazon, all aware this is likely to be their last group outing before the responsibilities of adulthood take them in separate directions. High on adrenaline, plans for an early night before the hike quickly fade, and overindulgence in liquor and drugs setting the stage for the strangest of tales from the locals. And one hell of a hangover. Fairy stories for adults, folklore to keep the drinks flowing, grab your backpack and mosquito repellent, there's only one way to find out. Be sure to check it out today. You can hear more from Olivia Steele right here on our very own network, as well as on her YouTube channel called Scarily Olivia. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Otis Jarry, and as always, it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we, once again, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling tales for dark nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.